and welcome to Out and About Art, your PGTV source for all things art in Polk County. I'm your host, Jasmine Ali. First up this month, we're heading to the Polk County Courthouse in Bartow to learn about an important initiative called Arts in Public Places. Through a partnership with the Arts Ensemble Education Foundation, the Arts in Public Places initiative was born out of the realization that the simple act of hanging artwork on the walls could help people achieve a sense of peace and calm in a difficult situation. Let's take a look. I greatly appreciate the sacrifice and service of our jurors and I'm constantly working to improve the jury experience. So in 2015, we partnered with the Arts Ensemble Education Foundation to brighten the jury experience. The Arts Ensemble Education Foundation is a community-based, not-for-profit organization whose mission is to inspire interest and maximize participation in the arts in Polk County and the surrounding region. By hosting a rotating selection of works of local artists, the Jury Art offers the opportunity to showcase the brilliance and talents of our many local artists, and it gives them an opportunity to share their talents and creations with those serving jury duty. Coming in for jury duty isn't necessarily a fun thing to do, so it's my hope that by filling the walls of our jury assembly room and jury waiting area, that it brightens the day for the jurors and helps put them in a good mood with a positive environment so they can perform their civic duty. My name is Nick Sudzina. I'm the trial court administrator for the 10th Judicial Circuit. And uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about arts in public places. In recent years, we have added artwork in the courthouse, specifically the law library, jury management, some judges' hearing rooms, and other public and private offices. And I think it's had a very positive effect on the people that work in the courthouse as well as the uh, citizens that come to court for various reasons, whether to pay a fine, to uh, attend a court hearing, uh, or to do legal research in our li library. Um, we have heard nothing but positive comments, and uh, I think people feel a sense of relaxation when they observe our artwork. Uh, people come to the courthouse under various degrees of duress, and uh, they may have never served on jury duty before. They might be facing a crisis situation in a court hearing. And uh, to see the artwork on display probably relaxes them somewhat. So we are very glad we have this partnership with the arts world and uh, the art guild. And we want to continue that. And uh, we welcome people to come to the courthouse uh, if you have occasion to visit and observe the fine artwork we have on display. Uh, in addition, we have artwork uh, classes in the courthouse and uh, it was really set up to uh, attract veterans that come to Behavioral Health Court to come and do painting because that has some therapeutic value and we have several veterans that have come to do paintings and uh, we have had several staff members express an interest and they have come to do paintings and their work product has been very uh, very impressive. I've had occasion to do two paintings and I can tell you it was very rewarding to me and um, you know, we're just glad to offer that to anyone that comes into the courthouse twice a month to jo join our painting classes. Amanda Horton, who's the law librarian, and I have been trying to get artwork in here because I've been an appreciator of art. And she said, well, hey, they're going to start an art class and they're, they're trying to gear it towards veterans and you're a veteran, so you know, maybe you should come to the class. I thought I would 
I'm not an artist. What, what good would that do? I mean, I, I'm going to mess up. And the only memories I had from art class go back to eighth grade where my art teacher taped my mouth shut with duct tape. Turned me off on art, okay? So it took a lot to go to the class. And that's what Carol Hughes made it very easy and comforting and reassuring that there are no mistakes. It, it's an excellent program. And it just really got to me in a way that not much else has. So I, I was extremely happy about that. And that was back in May. So all this goes from, from May to January. The first piece was a butterfly. And this is when the program first started out. And the, this is, of course, sponsoring or, or, or geared more towards veterans. I'm a Navy veteran. So my butterfly, I'm told, is hanging somewhere in the Capitol because they were, they were trying to get grant funding and stuff like that. And I think they picked my butterfly because if anyone was showing post-traumatic stress, it was probably the picture of my butterfly. We then went to some other different images where you learn about putting you know, flowers and plants and, and depth. And from that, I learned that, wait a minute, maybe I can play around and experiment a little bit more. Well, the inspiration really hit me and I decided to tackle on something a little bit more challenging. I, I like the idea of lighthouses and I wanted to grow from there. Got the canvas and I got the paint and I started playing around with it. And all these things from the class started popping up. I mean, there, there's no real mistakes. You can go with it, you can, you can uh, release the energy and so forth. And the more I went at this, the more the canvas came alive to me. And so here I am trying to paint something that I've never done before and tackle it and to show the energy. And I'm hoping that that's what's conveyed here because I'm trying to show the energy of the storm and that the waves are crashing up here and that there's this little lighthouse. I started this one in August, but most of the time it was staring at the canvas because I was intimidated. I go, how do you do this? So in the meantime, we do some of these other paintings and more and more that confidence gets built up. And I go, okay, let me try this. You learn that brushes can be your friend. And I now have probably over 50 different paint brushes. My, my back room in my house is now an art studio. And I've got a big uh, easel to, to work with and stuff like that. Um, I don't use Netflix. I don't use <laughs> these other internet-based things anymore. So when I want to relax, I find that this is very meditative. Because when you're doing this stuff, it's like you're being for lack of a better way to express it, you'd be one with the canvas. And the picture kind of comes out. All of these things, as you go through, as you know, I was going through these stages, I was learning something different from each painting. And um, I, I've meditated, I, I like meditation and stuff like that. I tend to be a little bit ADD when I'm in my real life. But when I'm in front of the canvas, the canvas itself kind of like shows me where to put stuff and, and, and it, you know, it like it calls me. So I, I get this idea. The, the picture I had, I had my, my uh, grandson had a 10 year old birthday. Um, I, we tell Jack of the Beanstalk stories all the time. I mean, it, you would think it's old hat because every time he comes over, he wants to hear a Jack of the Beanstalk story. And we always pretend it's the first time we've ever told the story. But I wanted to reproduce that, something that he could have. So I'm his papa. I did this little Jack of the Beanstalk. I have another son for his birthday present because now I'm inspired about doing art for, for something that you give them something from inside you. What better gift? Something that can only be given one time like that. So I, I did one which I call No Place Like Ohm. Hopefully when you see that you'll understand why it got its title. Uh, and that was a gift for my, my, my son who's up in Philadelphia. So art for me has been kind of a release. It's been kind of a mechanism to uh, get rid of stress. You know, During my day life, I work in the courthouse. I do, what, about uh, 12 to 20 divorces a week. So, you know, what do you do to, to de-escalate from that? A lot of us use things, you know, like movies and, and going out and, and, you know, drinking or whatever it is that for, for an outlet. Here is something that's healthy and it's something that really makes you feel connected. And if you have that spiritual inclination, you, you find that we're all creators at heart. And this was a way to show me that I could do that. So I'm very happy with that. For more information on the Arts in Public Places initiative, and to learn more about Arts for Vets classes, visit www.artsensemble.org. This month's Artist Spotlight features an ancient form of temporary body art called henna. Tejal Mehta learned how to create henna as a child in India and has been practicing it ever since. She created her own business, Henna Lakeland, to spread her knowledge and passion for the traditional art form throughout the Central Florida area. Here's a look at the incredible artwork of Tejal Mehta.
henna is all natural, so it's good for any ages. Not only that, I've done pregnant bellies. They are so beautiful. And um, uh, again, yeah, it's made out of all natural. It's called uh, Lasagna Innermis is the powder, and we enhance it through different natural oils. Basically, you have to keep the henna on um, for at least eight hours. But if you take it, if you do it at night, you can just go to sleep with it. And in the morning, when you wake up, you just flake it off and then you put a little bit of Vaseline or olive oil. It basically fades as your epidermis, like your first layer of skin uh, fades. Some people say it lasts one week, some people say two weeks. The maximum I've gotten, some people, and I get that very rarely, few people have said it lasted them four weeks. But again, it, it depends on the skin and chemistry of your body. Like personally, I don't have so much heat in my body. Mine usually lasts a week and a half. My daughter, her lasts about two and a half weeks because she has more heat and it takes up better color. So when you have heat and certain type of skin, keeps henna longer. So that's how it works. The original usage of henna was more medicinal. That little area of Middle East, Pakistan and Northwest India, that's where the henna grows the best. And that place is really super hot. Basically what they did, they crushed the leaves and slapped it on their hands and bottom of their feet and it basically cooled them down. It, it basically sucks the, sucks the heat of your body and it, it gives you a cooling feeling. And then how they like, they discovered it gives really beautiful color, you know, so then Indian culture adapted in their own way. The adoption came as like when women in India, they were basically, they, they used to get arranged marriage and they started uh, at, the, at the time of marriage, they started doing henna on their hands and feet of their bottom. So the tradition came about that they, until the henna fades away, um, the women don't really do anything in the house. They get to know the family, in-laws and everything. Because once it faded away, I'm sorry to say that, but they were almost treated like slaves, you know? They, after that, they became literally slaves to the family, you know? So that's how the tradition in Indian, uh, Indian culture started. Um, there is um, uh, Middle Eastern, they do henna too. They have their own little thing happening. So like, as I say on my Facebook page, um, that henna is very versatile. You can give your own meaning to the henna, you know? So that's how it started and each culture has their own little meanings. I was born and raised in India. So everyone did it around me, like my mom, my, my sister, my neighbors. We just grew up with this henna thing, you know. We did it almost every month on each other's, you know, we, we hung around together and I did henna on each other. My mom actually did it traditionally. She would just have a paste in a bowl and she would have a stick and she would dip it each time and make design, dip it, make design. That's how uh, initially it started. My sister, Falguni, she always did it uh, when I was young. There's a little story behind that. When my sister did it when I was young, I would always fight with her. I was like, she would never want to do henna on me because I'll be like, sister, that line is not straight. This is horrible. And she hated doing henna on me. So um, I just wanted to do henna and I'm sorry, I must say, but it was more like, look, I can do better lines than you. <laughs> it was one of those things. But she really admi admires me too. She, she loves when, when I do henna. Now she comes and she's like, do, do henna on me. And no one ever really taught me. I just saw and I just, because I was uh, around it, I just caught it, you know, and I just always wanted to do it. So I just, I just started doing. It is a type of skill, it does require you're so practiced to, to be really perfect at it. As you, as you were saying earlier, you make it look so easy because uh, now it is so easy after so many years. Uh, because I had passion, it was a lot easier to learn so quick and I had always been around and seen it. Like my daughter, she does, she just sees it and she makes beautiful flowers, you know? It's, it's, it's just, I think, some of those things. I have tried teaching few few people, like few of my, um, my friend's uh, daughter and stuff like that. Um, I personally think it is more innate. It has to be in you naturally and you have to have passion. People, I mean, you can, anyone can learn, don't get me wrong. It's like English, you know, anyone can learn English, but getting it grammatically correct, not everyone can do it, you know what I mean? No, but um, you can look at a design like, 
a lot of women they do they they do learn henna and there are a lot of women out there they look at the design and they copy it they can do that and they're pretty good at that too but doing it naturally coming it from rain has to be within within you and it has to be in me yes um, I do a lot of like birthday parties uh, graduation now it has become so normal um, to celebrate uh, basically any occasion like that you know and people just call me up like I have that friend earlier who was getting it done she she loves Hannah so much she just calls me up once uh, once after like every six months or so she's like hey I just I want some henna I'm like yay come on over and we'll get you some henna I kind of do make it kind of like a therapy session because those women who come by uh, they talk about things that they're going in their life and I, I share some of the things that I'm going through my life and I just create this natural bond with women you know um, and and again, a lot of henna clients have become really good friends of mine, you know. I would love to beautify people who are going through, uh, through cancer, who has lost their hair. I want to create beautiful henna crumbs for them. And uh, I would love to start a nonprofit for that. Um, I am planning to apply to GiveWell Foundation, but they require you to have 501c3. I did half of the paperwork, but I'm looking for board members. I know it's, it's the beginning um, and it's hard to have board members who would be um, interested in giving their time for free and I can't do anything alone, you know. I, I definitely need support uh, to take my vision to next level, you know. And um, that's one of the ideas that I have for the city of Polk County. Each and individual experience uh, keeps me going. Actually, there are points. I'm like, should I even do this? I mean, to be honest, I don't make a lot of money doing this, but I just do it because I feel like I'm making little difference in someone's life just for a moment. Even that moment, if that that is making them um, forget and free, uh, forgive uh, whatever they're going through, that's just a beautiful moment to be in and that keeps me going. Keep up with the artwork of Tejal Mehta and book an appointment for your own henna session by following her on Facebook. Just search for Henna Lakeland. For our last segment of the entire year, we're getting into the Christmas spirit at the Bach Tower Pinewood Estate. The Holiday Home Tour is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year, and volunteers have been working since January to plan out decorations and concepts for each room of the estate. I was lucky enough to take a peek inside and learn about the process from two hardworking volunteers, Jenny Dunson and Patty Bostick. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Patty Bostick and I am a volunteer at Bach Tower Gardens, Pinewood Estate. Um, I'm also a, um, one of the decorators for Christmas at Pinewood. Every year after Bach Pinewood closes, the Bach Tower staff, we get together with them and they propose a theme for the next year. And so we've been working on this theme since January, the end of January, the end of February, this year because of the 90th anniversary of Bach Tower Gardens and the 25th anniversary of Christmas at Pinewood. Um, one of the themes that was proposed was bringing the outside in. Every year before now, we've had a storyline that was about the Buck family and spending Christmas here and um, so the storyline was all about what they would have done and how they would have spent their holidays here and what you know kind of traditions they have but this year we did not have a storyline which is totally different and we went with bringing the outside in as a tribute to the gardens and to the 25th anniversary of Christmas at Pinewood. I am Jenny Dunson and I am from Winter Haven and I have been decorating and helping with this lovely house. I feel so fortunate to have been asked to help um, for the last five years. As far as the ownership of this house, um, Bach Tower bought it um, back in the 70s. There were three previous owners that had the house after Mr. Buck and um, it's just a wonderful house. I'm, I just love, I come out here, it's so peaceful, and I am an interior designer by trade, and I love all the architect, 
sculpture that has been done here and all the special little detail in every room, the tile floors, all the woodwork, um, the doors, the, fifth, the carvings on all the doors. It's, it's just a really special, special place. So it starts with um, boards and looking through tons of magazines, historical books, Pinterest, places where we know that have been decorated before, um, historical homes that are, you know, people love, like the Biltmore House, and we've just gone over and over and over, and it's a lot of, there's a lot of detail. Um, we put the uh, pictures that we find on the board, and then what we, what we expect from those boards is that we will have a feeling. We may not do everything that we've pictured on the board, but we want each room to have the feeling that we've pictured on the board. So that's how it starts. And then we start, from there, we start pulling things from our inventory in our storeroom to go with how we feel you know, the room and what we want the room to be. One of the special rooms that we came up with this year is the loggia. And it's the room that has the big um, arched doors that go out to both the patio, the frog fountain, or go out to the other area where you look down on a pond. And we were trying to come up with a theme for that room, and we were going to go blue and white. And I found some peacocks back in May that I decided that maybe we should make that a peacock themed room because the peacocks did stroll around in the yard wild in the years ago. So we have come up with a theme and have the peacocks all over our tree and, and a big wreath in that room. And then in the music room, which is the big room, we've decided to make that a real real woodsy, homely, um, with a fireplace at, at both ends and um, we have Santas everywhere and the piano. That's a really warm, cozy uh, area that everyone seems to love. And upstairs we have uh, Mr. Buck's room with the birds. He was also a, a sportsman that loved to bird hunt and we have lots of bird nests that we wanted to bring the, in that room as well. And just throughout, we've got, as you come up the stairwell, we've got a wonderful tree that has got owls and all the wonderful outdoor animals in that is just, you know, really spectacular. And we have it on the ledges. We had some volunteer that had built boxes for us to put trees and all the little animals in. And then you go to Lucy's room, which is very special. We've tried to make that elegant. And instead of doing a tree, you have a surprise in there for, you have to come see. We won't tell you the surprise, but it's a very special, special room because she was a very special lady. We have the most amazing volunteers. We have people that have been with us for five years and a couple of new people that were just wonderful this year. Um, between Jenny and myself, we have uh, a group that helps to come with, up with the ideas and submit things and throw around um, ideas. And then when we actually get to the house and start decorating, um, we had two gentlemen this year from Bach Tower that helped us on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then we have a lot of help from the staff here um, at Bach Tower and Pinewood. But the volunteer hours that it takes, um, it's all day long for three weeks and we had probably about 15 to 16 volunteers off and on. You know we get all caught up in the everyday life and we forget our surroundings of where we were all brought up. I was brought up in Florida fifth generation and you know to have this history I think it's so important and when you do speak about Bach Tower to people and say, hey, have you been to Pinewood and seen the Christmas? Oh no I didn't realize and you, ha you have to to go and see the, um, it's so important that we restore this house and this is one of the main objectives that we had decorating this house. Patty had asked me to come along and help her is restoring this house and back to um, like it used to, if, as Mr. Buck was here every Christmas and that I think has been one of the most, I guess, exciting things I get the joy out of and I can be creative 
and how he must have lived here at the time. I created this room. Um, I'm fifth generation in the citrus business, and as far as Bach Towers, uh, citrus has surrounded Bach Tower for many, many years, and I wanted to bring that feel and history into this room by adding the citrus, the magnolia um, flowers and leaves and all the greenery. Um, I feel it's real important for people to know a little of our history and the main industry of what our area was, once was, is citrus. We um, suggest online tickets or at the gate when you come through or even at the visitor center you're able to buy a ticket to come. It is a separate ticket to come to the Pinewood Estates. Um, when you come to tour here at the house, you are handed a brochure and it has a little description of every room throughout the house, so sort of how we did a little bit of the storyline of each room and how we decorated it. And there we do have wonderful docents here that take everybody through the tour and um, will explain certain things and can answer certain questions for who, if they have something. I, it's just a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, I feel so very pr privileged and honored that I've been able to be a part of this the last five years. If you want to get into the Christmas spirit and you really, really want to, you know, connect with your community, this is a great place to do it. Tickets for the Holiday Home Tour at Pinewood Estate may be purchased in advance at www.bocktowergardens.org. Tours will take place until January 5th, 2020. Well, that's all I have for this month, but there's always plenty going on within the Polk County art scene. Stay tuned for a list of art events in your area. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time for more art out and about.